I think it's a mistake to have banned uh, uh, these BBC documentaries. First, as you said, because uh, with internet you can always see them, and if you you know if you look even now if you look a little bit and you search a little bit the internet you will find links and be able to see them. And secondly, it reinforces that image that uh, Mr. Modi is a dictator <clears throat> and uh, that no freedom of expression is allowed in India. So from that point of view, I would say it's a mistake. Um, and I would say that the uh, the media advisory that Mr. Modi has is the wrong kind of advisory and they're not giving him the right input. So this is my on, on restricting myself on that banning of the BBC documentaries. The first part of the BBC, which mainly uh, you know deals with Godra, I have supported Mr. Modi a lot. It's a difficult uh, discussion for me because at that time in 2002, um, when I was still a very active reporter, I supported Mr. Modi because I knew that the burning of the 58 pilgrims, Ayuda pilgrims in the Samar Bani Express by you know Muslim mob was real. And I knew that this was what, what triggered the pogrom against Muslim in Ahmedabad and other parts of uh, of uh, Gujarat, from the Brahmins to the to the Dalits, you know, the the Gujaratis went down in the streets and, rightly or wrongly, most probably wrongly, started you know, killing Muslims right and left. Now, in my mind, in that time, um, I didn't think that Mr. Modi encouraged killing. Uh, the only question was whether he delayed the calling of the army for 24 hours or so. This was the only question in my mind. So I supported Mr. Modi because I felt that the burning of these 50,000, 58 Hindus, you know, was a very brutal, they were, you know, burned like animals. And, you know, if my own wife or daughter had been killed in that way, I would also have gone down the streets in anger, rightfully or wrongfully. Anger is never good. Violence is never good. Agreed. But at the same time, I couldn't pin the whole blame on Mr. Modi, and I still don't blame I put the whole blame on Mr. Modi. He's not the one who went down and killed Muslims. You know, it is the Gujarati themselves. And I think that the Godra incident was a spark, you know, that ignited a long time. This kind of pogroms do not happen in a day that they happen because there is some pent up frustration or fury, and then there's a spark and you know it fire and there's a fire that erupts and it's difficult to control. So the only question was whether Mr. Modi waited for the army to intervene because he felt himself that the Muslim deserved to die for what they had done to the Ayurveda pilgrim. That was the only question. Now, again, I'm going to restrict myself to that. Uh, we'll come later to, to the second part of the BBC about Kashmir and about what I feel about Mr. Modi today. I want to add that it's the timing also that makes it look like a conspiracy because now the G20 is happening. Um, you know, I'm in Pondicherry at the moment. Uh, some of the Degelis were in Pondicherry. Uh, uh, in Oroville, I will talk a little bit about that later. And uh, the timing of the uh, of the release of these two documentaries just before the G20, knowing that Mr. Modi is so proud of India hosting the G20 for one year, and he's so keen at the moment to be seen as a respectable leader, <clears throat> you know. Whereas I think he's still universally hated for these Godra uh, riots. So, so the timing seems to me you know, leading to, to to your title of a conspiracy uh, to defame furthermore Mr. Modi when India is hosting the G20 uh, events and delegates. We saw during the 2611 attacks on Mumbai you know, that the, the special forces at that time, the Congress was in power, the special forces, you know, from Delhi to Bombay took like 48 hours to reach Bombay. Uh, by that time, the damage had been done. So. You know, I, I'm sure that Mr. Modi was angry at uh, at, at the Godra, the burning of Sabadi Express. But uh, you also have to take into account the you know ineffectiveness of uh, of the Indian Special Force, of the army, of of the transport, the difficulty of transporting troops to I don't know because from from Delhi to Bombay it would have been in few, matter of few hours in any country in the world. The Taj Mahal is attacked, uh, you know, big hotels are attacked like they were with many Westerners. Within a few hours, within two, three hours, special forces have been there. In, in Mumbai, we saw, I was horrified myself. I was horrified that, you know, what an image it brings of India that uh, uh, 
special forces are not able to come to a scene of terrorism in a few hours time from the capital Delhi to the economic capital Mumbai. So I won't pull the, put the whole blame, Mr. Modi, knowing that, yes, there is a doubt, whereas he delayed the calling of the army to stop the riots, to bring order in the streets of Gujarat and Ahmedabad. What is missing in the BBC and New York Times and Le Monde in my country and The Guardian is that the, either it is not mentioned that 58 Hindus were burned to death by a Muslim mob, or it is it is doubted that whether it was a Muslim mob, whether it was an accidental fire. So, so this, I find, also leads to a theory of conspiracy. Because we all know, and it's been proved, there have been so many inquiries, so many commissions you know, of inquiry that proved that there were, and people were arrested, they went to jail, that there was a mob you know, led by a local Congress councilman who, which attacked this train because it, has, it was coming from Ayodhya. And we know that Ayodhya and Babri Mashid, I covered Babri Mashid, uh, the raising of the Babri Mashid. When I, you know, for, for Le Figaro, is such an explosive issue, uh, with, with particularly with Muslims, that they feel that the raising of that mosque, which was actually an empty mosque, but uh, nevertheless was an insult, insult to Islam. So, so the fact that they were coming from Ayodhya and they had some, some seva in Ayodhya uh, provoked uh, the anger and the fury of, of the Muslims and this particular mob burned the trade. So this is always omitted from most Western accounts. This is why Mr. He Mr. Modi is so hated in the world. He doesn't understand today. Uh, he's too, in my country, in France, uh, every newspaper man, every editor, you know, every publisher even, when I try to write a biography of Mr. Modi and propose it to French editors, he's universally hated, and, but, but he thinks he's loved. So this is one of the tragedies of Mr. Modi, that he doesn't understand the amount of hatred uh, by the media, propagated mostly by the media, but also to governments uh, that has been fueled by the uh, Godra riots. But I think the doubt about Mr. Modi has never been resolved. Uh, of course, he came to power in his second mandate, and he was re-elected in Gujarat you know, two or three times after that. But uh, what has happened in Godra is uh, something that is still uh, festering. It's a wound that is festering and is plagued. It's been like a curse on Mr. Modi. Uh, not in India, because there is a certain degree of nationalism and, you know, pride about what Mr. Bodhi has done so far. But abroad, uh, this has never been resolved. The doubt has never been, you know, erased. Uh, but Mr. Modi roars in his riots, and it's a curse that uh, even though he will be going to be re-elected uh, in 2024, will uh, continue to haunt him, I think. I think it's Goebbels, you know, that uh, Hitler's uh, propaganda minister who said, if you negate the truth you know, repeatedly, then after some time, nobody knows where the truth and, and the lies are. And I think it happened for many things, but it's true for, for Godra. If you keep saying that, oh, no, there is no proof that 59 uh, Hindus were burned like animals, you know, it may accidental fire or some, you know, or they had kept some tea, uh, they were boiling tea in the compartment, you know, you then it puts doubt in people's mind. But as a journalist, as I saw it, you know, I, 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 with my intuition, with my intelligence, with my, you know, it seemed to me like a truth that it happened. It happened, and this triggered uh, a tremendous fury on the part of Hindus, and they went on a rampage. And again, uh, you cannot say that Mr. Modi would ever hurt to encourage his rampage and the riots. You know? Whether he delayed in calling the army, knowing that you know, justice was done by killing Muslims. Again, this will never be proved. Uh, nobody, he will never say himself. And Amit Shah, who probably knows, will never say himself. But Amit Shah did go to jail, though. Uh, uh, so some justice was uh, was done. But negate the truth and keep on negating the truth. And nobody knows the truth is anymore. But I think in India, a fair, fair amount of people trust Mr. Modi on that matter that there was a Sabamati burning and that triggered the riots. And maybe or maybe not, Mr. Modi delayed in calling the army. And I think in India, the chapter is more or less closed, except for you know, the Congress, the opposition, some of the journalists and intelligentsia like Ramachandra Gua and others. 
but but I think in India the chapter is closed. It's a broad that uh, it has done Mr. Modi a lot of harm, and now he's an elected prime minister. After all, he's been elected by at least four hundred to five hundred million people, so he has gained some leverage and some respect. Uh, but the doubt remains abroad about uh, about his role in the Gujarat. But but it's a you know it's it's not a very logical and uh, based on facts doubt and hatred that is you know that is carried abroad by many of the uh, of the western governments and the ngos in the united states and muslim organizations christian organizations uh, it is not based on truth i think you know, i think the chapter is closed in india as i said but uh, most of the history i mean i have i have written several books on indian history and there are many many theories uh, which are still uh, the foundations of most history books, whether written by Indians or written by Westerners, like the Aryan invasion theory, you know, like Ashoka, whether he converted to Buddhism because of the horror of Kalinga, you know, like Alexander the Great, whether he had a triumphant uh, entry into India, whether he was wounded, you know, and half defeated and had to retreat. So, so you know, whether whether Mahatma Gandhi is floating around now that Mahatma Gandhi was is really the father of nation, or whether it was people like Sri Aurobindo and, and Tilak who actually started the, the real movement for independence. So you know, Godra is part of this. Godra will go down in history as an unresolved mystery. Uh, but but I think in India, most Indians, I would say 75% of India. Uh, you know, accepting the, the Muslim minority uh, and some of the intelligence, yeah, for them the chapter of Godra is closed. That is why Mr. Modi has been re-elected with such a majority uh, as Prime Minister for a second term. That is why uh, BGP has won in Gujarat uh, in the last 20 years and is winning many of the states in India. So I think in, in India the chapter is closed, but as far as Mr. Modi is concerned, it is, you know, it is it is a curve that he has to carry because his image abroad has been damaged by Godra. And so he has been trying to reach out to all these foreign leaders, and he's been trying to reach out in India to everybody, the Dalit, the Muslim, the Bollywood, so as to soften his image of a hard man, of, a, of the man of Godra who, you know, ruthlessly or cynically let Muslims be massacred. He's been desperately, I must say, trying to soften his image, and not successfully because, uh, to my understanding and my experience, whenever I travel, uh, in France or elsewhere, uh, he still carries that curse of Godra. So yes, it is an unresolved mystery. And yes, I think it will go down as an unresolved mystery because uh, Mr. Modi will take it to his grave. But the media, the handling of Mr. Modi uh, with the media, I think uh, the accusation that uh, Mr. Modi is a dictator, which I have long uh, fought against because I always felt that there's a great freedom of expression in India. That you know, I'm a white man, I'm a non-Indian, non-Hindu, but I have lived in this country for a long time, and I've never been asked my papers in the street like like it can happen in New York or Paris if you're from a different color or a different religion. Uh, I've traveled from Kanyakumari till Tawang in the Arunachal Pradesh, and I have with great freedom. But uh, it is true that in the last two, three years, uh, there has been a centralization of power in the hands of Mr. Modi and his PMO. And uh, I, I hesitate to say because I've defended the man for so long, but uh, it is true that uh, there is a hint of dictatorship that has come through. And the BBC hints at that, you know, and they're not totally wrong about it. There is a less press freedom. The media is more nationalist now, It is, but it doesn't criticize Mr. Modi. And more than that, within the, the BGP party, nobody dares to raise the voice. You know, after what happened to that spokesperson of the, of the BGP, and recently when Mr. Modi said, you know, don't say anything about Bollywood, whereas in the social media, there is so much you know, about Bollywood, about the fact that Bollywood has portrayed Hindus in a bad light you know, for, for decades. Uh, well, you know, nobody in the BGP dares to raise the voice anymore. So Mr. Modi is an absolute, you know, dictator might be a strong word, but yes, you know, he controls everything and he has a tight leash on the minister, he has a tight leash on, on, the, on the BGP. And there's also, I think, uh, from his PMO, uh, 
uh, from the media cell of the PMO, uh, I know, and I know the gentleman in charge of that cell, uh, there's also a, a bit of a tight leash on the media instruction given to the media. So yeah, I'm a little uneasy, even though I have been a defender of Mr. Modi for a long time, about the centralization of power in the hands of Mr. Modi and the PMO. Now, to come back to the BBC, uh, you know, I, I disagree with uh, with uh, what they say about Godra, but uh, the part where Mr. Modi is accused of, uh, you know, controlling everything, yes, there is a truth in it. The second part of the BBC deals, you know, with Kashmir, a lot with Kashmir, with Article 370, and I covered Kashmir extensively. I, I went to Kashmir as a, as a tourist, you know, I went to the Dal Lake and stayed on houseboats, and then uh, as a journalist, I, I witnessed the the rise of the militancy in those days with GKLF. Uh, there was the kidnapping of uh, of the daughter of that uh, of that minister. I forgot his name. Uh, so, and I see, I saw the first killing of the Kashmiri bandit leaders in Srinagar, like Dr. Tiku, who was a surgeon, the director of Dwarashan. And then I was there when uh, I had interviewed Benazir Bhutto earlier. And I was there when she gave a cry of Azad Kashmir, and the next Friday all the mosques asked Hindus to convert or flee or die. So I saw the exodus of the uh, Kashmiri Hindus from the Valley of Kashmir. So uh, when, <laughs> when today the Kashmiri Muslims portray themselves uh, as victims, uh, not true, because they started a war against India in the name of Islam. The, and they were trained they were trained and armed and uh, financed by Pakistan. In those days, we knew, I knew that, you know, they would go to, to the, through the line of control, which is very porous. I spent a lot of time there. They would go to the Pakistan side of Kashmir, then they'd be trained in and weapons and, uh, and, you know, and grenades and so on, uh, given some money and then push back into the line of control. In those days, the BBC said this is not true. I remember Mark Talley was the he was the head of the BBC uh, uh, bureau in Delhi, and at that time there was not so much television. CNN was starting; there was only Doordarshan. Uh, so Mark Talley, whatever Mark Talley said was was, you know, was gold for us uh, journalists, lesser journalists, whether we were Westerners or, or, or Indians. Uh, so Mark Talley kept saying it is not true that. Uh, uh, that Pakistan is uh, arming and uh, financing and training these uh, Kashmiri uh, militants who started the war against India. But I knew it was true. It made sense. It was logical. Today, nobody has disputed that fact. But when the BBC says, says that Article 70 was an injustice, I witnessed this Kashmiri Hindus who had done, never done any violence against the Kashmiri Muslims. They were like brother and sister. They lived for generation in the Valley of Kashmir. I know they used to go to their houses for you know for Eid. Uh, the, you know Hindus, you know, good good people, weak but good people. So when they were chased out for no other reason that they belong to another religion from the Valley of Kashmir, I was shocked. You know, I mean, it was my opening as a journalist. I had all these cliches, but when I saw that, I was shocked. And then I saw also, because I traveled a lot, that though no Indian could come to Kashmir, especially the Valley of Kashmir, first because it was dangerous, and secondly because Mr. Nehru had made a law called Article 270, whereas nobody from outside, whether they were Indian from Tamil Nadu or from you know Delhi, could come and invest in the Valley of Kashmir, buy a house, start a business, uh, by land, but Kashmiri Muslims, you know, they're all over India. They, they are taking the souvenir uh, trade. Uh, they sell their carpets and papier mache and uh, whatnot and drugs from Delhi to Chennai to Pondicherry. You know, they are, you know, they in Pondicherry and Oroville, they're there. You know, they pay very high prices for the shops and they control the the market. So. Article 70 was an injustice because Indians couldn't go to Kashmir, but Kashmiris could come to India. So I think Mr. Modi said something which was wrong, right. And again, I'm defending Mr. Modi, so I, I may criticize him for other things. But again, I think that uh, one, Article 70 was an injustice, and uh, when he removed it, it was uh, justice done. And two, uh, you know, Kashmiri are not martyrs. You know, they started the war against India, and today they may cry, 
but uh, they're the one who started the war. I don't think that India went out of its way to attack Kashmiri Muslims, to kill them. It is the Kashmiri Muslims, first with JLK, then later with uh, Mujahideen, which started killing Indians and Hindus, and you know, so the army had to be called. And I think the Kashmiri problem is not going to be solved. Mr. Modi can keep on pouring you know, billions of rupees like the Congress did before him. But uh, my experience is that the Kashmiri Muslim feel closer to Pakistan because of Islam than they feel to India and Hindu. So, you know, the cracks of the matter will never get solved. But the BBC did an injustice on Mr. Modi by saying that Article 370 uh, was something wrongly done. I, I don't know if you agree with me, but uh, I have covered Kashmir a lot and I'm very clear about it. Kashmir is a very complicated uh, problem and, and Indians themselves are ignorant about Kashmir. There's Ladakh, which are the majority of, of Buddhists, uh, most of them followers of the Dalai Lama. Then there is Jammu, we used to have a strong Hindu majority, but it is dwindling today for several reasons, because uh, they have moved out the Hindus or they're scared and there have been, you know, on the, on the outskirts of Jammu and the border of Jammu, there have been a lot of attacks on Hindus. And then there's the Valley of Kashmir, where, where the, there is a Muslim majority, but there was in 1900, still a million Hindus uh, in, in the census of 1900. Oh, and today, in the Valley of Kashmir itself, there probably are no Hindus left. So, Pakistan always felt that Kashmir should have, in, in, the part, in the logic of the partition, and they're not totally wrong, in the logic of partition, which Nehru and Gandhi accepted blindly, uh, Kashmir should have gone back gone to Pakistan because it had a border, you know, it was contiguous with Pakistan, the newly created Pakistan also, and it also had a Muslim majority. So Pakistan went furious with the Maharaja Hari Singh uh, opted to, after a lot of hesitations, to uh, attach his state to India. So as you know, there have been three, three wars, four, if you can Kargil, fought about Kashmir. I, I, and as I said, I don't think the Kashmir problem can be solved uh, okay, tourism, my, tourism might start again, and uh, you know, Bollywood film might be shot in the Valley of Kashmir. It's quite beautiful, but ultimately, the Kashmiri Muslim feel that we are not Indian. There are there are few places in India where you talk to people, you know, like Tripura or Kashmir. They say, no, no, we are not Indian. We're not Indian. So in, the Kashmiri Muslim feel that they're not Indians. So, so this this, in my view, with my experience of covering Kashmir, I feel. This is a problem that uh, will, uh, you know, pursue, you know, every government that comes, whether it is BGP or Congress, because it's extremely difficult to, to solve. But, uh, you know, the Hindus are, are not happy because they can't go back to the Valley of Kashmir. It's absolutely dangerous and, you know, they would risk their lives. Uh, to go back to the Valley of Kashmir and their land and the house have long been taken. There has been no comp competition. Of course, um, there is a strong family system in India. So the Kashmiri Hindus, you know, somehow they resettle uh, in different families, uh, Delhi or they went abroad. Uh, so, you know, but, but they're unhappy because they can't go back. No government can bring them back unless, uh, and when I was covering Kashmir already, you know, the army was in fortresses in Srinagar. Uh, that was long ago, you know, in, in the 90s and early 2000s. Uh, the army would not go out unless it was enforced in the streets of Srinagar or in the rest of the Valley of Kashmir, because already it was under siege. So you know, it's, it's a difficult problem. And uh, you, uh, Kashmiri Hindus are unhappy because they lost their homeland. You know, they became refugees in their own country. You no, know, you can say Palestinians are refugees, but but the Kashmiri Hindus are refugees in their own country within India, and this is something unique which uh, you know, newspapers and media like the BBC forgot to highlight. From March thirty till today, uh, we hear the you know the the woes of the Kashmiri Muslim because it's true that the army has a heavy presence and it's a war. You know, so war is not you, know, you don't fight a war with gloves. But we don't hear the side of the Kashmir Hindus who lost their house, their, their land, you know, their, for, where they had been for generations. It's a, I think it's a heartbreaking story, and uh, I understand their their discontent. Even when I was covering Kashmir, the, the UN had an office in Srinagar, and we used to go and see them. Other kind of okay, let's go and talk to them anyway.
but uh, we never felt that uh, they they were playing an important role. They were they were bypassed by the Indian government, um, but the Pakistan, uh, you know, the Pakistan are better public relation than India. Actually, they're, they're much better public. Even today, you can say that uh, Mr. Modi and his uh, his media cell are not good public relation. They don't understand what is public. But the Pakistanis do you know, make friends with people, you know, be friendly, bring out the point of view. If necessary, you know, uh, you know, hire some high level, you know, PR agency uh, like the Pakistanis in the United States. But I stand by my point that uh, the issue of Kashmir can only be solved by either a peaceful or a forceful reunification of Pakistan and India. This is what Shiromido said uh, in 1947, that uh, the division of India on religious line was a grave mistake and that as long as uh, Pakistan and India were not reunited, uh, India would know strife and problems and catastrophes, uh, which have happened. There have been four wars and uh, Kashmir uh, terrorism will will uh, rise again. Uh, there are you know, there are there are cycles in uh, in terrorism or in whatever you call it militancy. But I would like to come back to the role of the BBC because you know I, I listened to the BBC when I was a young journalist. I listened to the BBC because it was a credible voice you know, more than those Ashan uh, when Mrs. Gandhi was assassinated. The BBC was the first one to break the news. So so we listened to today. I still. Look you know, at the BBC on my app. I, I look at the BBC News because, you know, because it's serious journalism. There are fantastic documentaries. But as far as BBC India is concerned, from Mark Tully, it has been a story of, you know, people are thinking about Mr. Modi's uh, media saying, oh, it is colonialism. It is, but, but I don't think the young journalists of BBC who are working in London or in Delhi uh, think about the past. You know, they they just there's a trend on the BBC. Uh, to demean India, and I think it's been a fairly, uh, fairly continuous trend that uh, from Kashmir, when Mark Tully said that the Congress government was wrongly accusing Pakistan of fostering the the militancy uh, Indian Kashmir, till today when the BBC documentaries are hinting that Mr. Modi is a but you know is a is a barbarian and a butcher. Uh, the, the BBC has not been kind with India, uh, and I don't know why. Because I, as I said, you know, I do respect the BBC, and I think it's you know serious journalism. There have been some accusation that you know China is funding directly and indirectly some of the BBC uh, you know outlets. I don't know about that, but for sure the BBC is kinder to China, which is not a democracy, which is not Western friendly. Uh, uh, kind of to the to that president uh, who just been reelected uh, for the third time with a with a dictator. Then Mr. Mr. Modi would been elected. Whatever you say about Mr. Modi, he's been elected, you know, <laughs> twice uh, uh, democratically. You know, and uh, okay, whatever. There's a bit of a dictatorship, but India is still a free country where uh, where you know people can circulate freely. They can express their opinion. You know, the BBC was uh, documentaries were banned, and I think it was a mistake. But nevertheless, India is a friendly country. It's a democracy, it's friendly towards the West. So why is the BBC much harder on Mr. Modi than it is on the Chinese president, who is himself a dictator, who has blood on his hands? You know, uh, the Tibetans, uh, Tibetan Holocaust is something that uh, I'm very fond of the Dalai Lama. And uh, so, so these people are very ruthless. And even now, the way they are encroaching upon India and pretending to retreat, and then pretending to negotiate and then encroaching somewhere else. And every time, you know, the, whether it's the Congress or the or the BGP, they fall for it. You know? So uh, I, I feel that the BGP is very hard on India and Mr. Modi, and this is not right because it's a good, it's a very good, it's a very good media organ. Uh, it's a very, you know, it's a very ancient, you know, it's been there for a long time. So they're very hard, they, they are unjust, they're unfair on Mr. Modi. Though I criticize Mr. Modi myself, you know, uh, but they are a bit unfair on Mr. Modi, uh, and they are mu much kinder to the Chinese, who are much more ruthless and much more deadly than the Indians. See, when 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 the Chinese president Xi Jinping was, Xi Jinping was uh, re elected himself uh, non-democratically, uh, the BBC just put it as a uh, you know as a matter of fact. Okay, this happened. We have no comment about it. But when Mr. Modi was re-elected. Uh, democratically, uh, uh, the BBC put a stain on him uh, that uh, he's a dictator, he's a butcher. 
So I don't think this is very fair. I don't think it's very fair. India ne never invaded another country. You know, okay, you can speak about Godra, but apart from Godra, India has no blood on its hands, whether the Chinese, the Mao killed at least 10 million of his own citizens. Uh, in Tibet, they killed a million directly and indirectly. Uh, they're very ruthless people. So I, I don't know how you can compare in a, you know, in a balance the human rights in India and China. As I said, again, I live in India from I'm married to an Indian, and I experience here a lot of freedom. When a, you know, when when a Hindu like uh, Amrita Anandamai from Kerala opens an ashram in France, she faces the accusation of being a sect, you know, of you know, of uh, the, the village next to her ashram you know, creates a lot of problem. I think now it's kind of smoothed over. But uh, uh, in India, I'm associated with Auroville. Uh, all of it has been functioning for 55 years uh, with many Westerners. So there's a lot of freedom. The, the, the Hindu psyche is to you know, accept different, you know, I'm married to Hindu. Uh, she's a half Hindu, half Sikh. My father is a profound Catholic. So she goes to France. Uh, he wants to take her to church and she sees no, uh, no harm in going with him to church. You know? But uh, it's a one-way traffic because in India, a Christian will not go to a temple. In uh, whether a, a Hindu, like in Kashmir, they used to go to to mosque, uh, to Sufi mosque. Uh, uh, but a, a Christian, uh, Indian Christian, will not never go to a, to a temple, Hindu temple, because it's a sin. For a Muslim, of course, will never step, you know, because he feels that uh, worshiping uh, worshiping an image is something which is sacrilegious. So, uh, you know, I'm a defender of India and the Hindu because they are wonderful tolerant people and uh, uh, if you look uh, a good journalist you know, doesn't take a small event and make it a whole uh, if you look at the the entire history of india we see that hinduism is one religion that never invaded a, another country with a military force to impose its creed whether whether islam and christianity uh, uh, use the the the, the the force of the armies to impose their creed upon other people. The Hinduism never did that. So, uh, no, yes, I'm a defender of Hindus and uh, I'm not ashamed of it. And Mr. Modi was, uh, you know, an ardent defender of Hindus. Now, of course, he's the prime minister of India and he has to moderate his uh, views uh, and he's the prime minister of all Indians, whether they are Hindus or Muslims. But uh, I think the Hindus are wonderful people, and it's been a one-way traffic. As I said, in Kashmir, you know, they, they were very tolerant. They used to go to their Muslim brothers and sisters, but in return, you know, they were killed and they were hounded out of their homeland. So, yes, it's a story of injustice. And yes, I do read, look at the BBC every day, and if you make a census of the story they do on India the last two or three years, you will see that the majority of them are negative. There are very, very few stories that the BBC does nowadays on India which are positive. Most of them are negative. Most of them are critical. Most of them show India in a bad light. And Jafra Lowe has been an enemy of the Hindus for a long time. You know, he hates my guts. I hate his guts. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he's funded by the French government. So whatever Jafra Lowe says, uh, you know, he reaches the political and the bureaucratic sphere and the financial sphere. So he has a more influence than me in France. Uh, very unfortunate because, uh, as I said, he made a... Uh, his life task to demonize Hindus, whether, you know, Hindus are good people, man. I mean, they're good people, whether they are, you know, they're good people. And, and the majority of this country is still Hindu. Uh, so, no, I feel the BBC has been uh, very partial to India. And it, uh, whether, uh, even though I criticize Mr. Modi now, this documentary has proved it again that uh, they are, you know, they are at it to demonize uh, the BGP, uh, Mr. Modi, and the Hindus who have elected this uh, this party and this man to power and democratically elected, which is not the case in China. There is no democracy in China, and we know that China, you know, is claiming parts of India, is claiming uh, Arunachal Pradesh, you know, is claiming other parts of the world, Taiwan, and eventually they will get their way but uh, india is not like that you know they're not you know, they're not uh, forceful and ruthless and calculating in that way fortunately again it's a wonder traffic the congress dominated politics for a long long decade i mean rajiv gandhi after the assassination of his mother was re-elected with an absolute majority the congress ruled most of the states in india for a long long time 
Uh, so now that the BGP has got the upper hand, the Congress is crying for, uh, but, but you know, against the democracy, we see in Tamil Nadu that the DMK has been elected. It's a party that doesn't like Mr. Modi, doesn't like Hindi, doesn't like, you know, so fine, they're elected and nobody's saying anything. We see that the Congress still manages to win some state like Himachal Pradesh. We see that uh, Rahul Gandhi did a yatra and I think it was quite good of him, quite courageous to walk, you know, uh, 20 kilometers a day and travel from Kanekumari now is in Kashmir. So yes, in spite of the fact that Mr. Modi has centralized a lot of power in his hand, which Mrs. Gandhi did before him, you know, Rajiv Gandhi was an exception. He was a good man, you know, but he was a little ignorant about the realities of India. But uh, Narasimha Rao was a very tough man. I knew him a little bit. Uh, so, so yes, power is in Delhi. I, I, and you know, as a journalist, that unless you're in Delhi, uh, you're out of the power circle, you're out of the know-how. So this is one of the unfortunate uh, leftovers of the British colonialism is that Delhi was the power center, Delhi remained the power center, but the British put in, in place remains today and the ministers still live in their bangalows and still have this VVIP system whereby they cut off from the people. But India remains a democracy in my, in my opinion, in spite of these flaws. And uh, I, I see a bright future. Uh, and the, the moment the Indians feel that Mr. Modi uh, either has abused this power, they will you know, they will vote him out as they voted out in Gandhi before and so many others. So yes, I believe in Indian democracy. Uh, it is both a cliche that India is a great India is the greatest democracy in the world. It is a cliche, but it's also a truth. So yes, I'm positive about India. I think the democracy will survive. I think it's a little unfair that you know Muslims were invaders of this country and very strong and sometimes violent invaders. Today, as posing as martyrs, you know, so I, you know, I'm a little uneasy about that because I have read a lot of history. I've studied a lot of Indian history. You know, I did an exhibition on Aurangzeb, so I know you know what kind of rules he had, what kind of belief he had, he had hard Sunni belief. He was a very pious man, he was a very, you know, rigorous man, but, you know, he was a hard Sunni, and uh, he believed that image worship was sacrilegious, so he believed that Hindus uh, were lesser subjects, so nothing much has changed, but yet, you know, for the Muslim to say, oh, we are persecuted in Kashmir, Article 70 was unfortunate, uh, uh, the raising of uh, uh, Babri Masjid was, uh, you know, blot on democracy, whereas, you know, Muslims themselves raised, we know that, raised thousands and thousands of Buddhist, Jain, and Hindu temples, and the remains are still seen today, and, uh, you know, most of the, whether it's a Qutub Minar, whether it's a, a Krishna Mathura temple, they're still there for everybody to see. So the fact that, uh, you know, the BBC uh, portrays uh, Indian Muslims as persecuted is not only unfair, but also bad journalism.